Number 10, metal Maltesers. So this metallic floating bowling ball was just recorded in Perm, Russia. Yeah, giant metallic balls like this have been found literally littered all around the planet for decades, apparently. Most famously, ufologist Gary Nolan is currently now studying these metal Malteser looking things that people have collected over the years. Right now in Texas, there's a dude, nameless, who has a ton of these apparently. Jim Marlin, famous music producer, I guess named, was given these metal giant pinball spheres by a celebrity's bodyguard apparently, who said that they were dropped off from a craft in his backyard years ago. And like, a lot of these celebs have actually touched these things. Dennis Hopper, Jane Fonda, these things are famous like on their own. They also move on their own and apparently hold power and light up once in a while on their own. Like that's not scary at all. Hey dad, yeah your giant metal balls are floating again. And can you tape Survivor? It's the finale tonight. Number nine, Tom DeLong Instagram post. Yeah, Blink-182, I can confidently say that the three of us in this room right now are Blink-182 fans, right? Obviously, I remember enjoying their songs, Aliens Exist, that's one, that's, that one slapped right off the hop. But cut to 2022, former Blink member Tom DeLong, he's now the co-founder of To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science. Yeah, he's into aliens in real life now, not just in, not just in music. And 25 days ago, Tom DeLong posted what appears to be a photo of a real life alien. Says Tom DeLong, so you can be the judge of that. Here we go, what do you think? I vote real, I don't know, I'm like 80, 20. What do we think? That's real. That's real. Number eight, Tic Tacs. Ah yes, the classic declassified Tic Tac shaped UAPs. That's a mouthful, dude. Scrambling destroyers, flying jets over the ocean circa 2004. We know about these things, right? Disclosure happened, people. Let's get up to speed here. I mean, look at the formations alone. The choreography is beautiful. These aliens are some good drivers, huh? Are these things drones? I feel like we just figured drones out like in the last 20 years. Some of these videos are from like the 1700s. So like, what the hell's going on here? What are they doing over the water too? We haven't explored what, like 80% of our oceans? I say we get some GoPros down there, huh? A little drain the ocean action? There's gotta be like some sort of octopus species that likes free diving or snorkeling or something, you know? Trans medium vehicles, people. Write that down. Number seven, lost habitable worlds. Remember back in 2020 when we casually discovered phosphine on Venus? Yeah, in the middle of 2020 of all time. Data from 40 years ago resurfaced and it was documents from an old NASA mission where they may have overlooked this phosphine for the entire time. Yeah, whoops, didn't see that sign of life there for 40 years. Found it, let's talk. Yeah, this compound of phosphorus and hydrogen, this is eye-opening. So what's next? Well, NASA is interested to say the least. They're currently preparing to launch two new missions to Venus to check this out. This is part of NASA's discovery program that they're launching in 2030, so we still got a little bit of time. The Da Vinci Plus and the Verita S. Now the first one is a deep atmosphere Venus investigation of noble gases, chemistry, and imaging. Kind of a mouthful, but that's why we say Da Vinci. There we go. Then the second one, the second drone, will map Venus's surface and study its geologic history and hopefully get an understanding as to what happened to such a lost habitable world. Yeah, maybe there's humans there. Maybe we got old and we died and then we came here. Oh, number six, carbon on Mars. It's one thing to have Elon tweeting about going to Mars, but when NASA talks about it, it's interesting. I get an eerie feeling. I'm like, oh, I kind of believe this a little bit more. Elon's Twitter is a little off the chain, so more than fair. They're old school, you know what I mean? They're like, we may have found carbon 40 years ago. Stay tuned, papers everywhere. It's so NASA to have papers all over the place when you discover something. Well, in 2022, quite recent, just back in January, NASA's Curiosity rover measured carbon signatures on Mars. And we got Venus, we got Mars, what's next? Earth? Yeah, gotcha. Paul Mahaffey, principal investigator of the sample analysis over at Mars, he says, quote, we're finding things on Mars that are tantalizingly interesting, but we would really need more evidence to say we've identified life. Okay, so we're close. We're definitely close. We need more evidence, not all the evidence. We just need a little bit more. And then we're finding aliens up on Mars, the big red planet. Imagine going to Mars with Elon Musk. Like imagine like winning a trip and that's what you get. I would pay millions of dollars to not do that. How does that sound? Number five, asteroid redirection. This one happened like a week ago and it snuck up on all of us. It has Michael Bay written all over it. I was pretty excited for this project, I'm not gonna lie. NASA landing a craft onto a moving asteroid is one thing, but their asteroid redirection mission was next level. Their plan was for NASA to catch an asteroid using hypothetically a large space inflatable and no, I'm not joking. And then they would move said asteroid to the moon where it would orbit for their studies. Yeah, we're just gonna adopt a rock and then have astronauts land on it and then study the moon. I don't think this is gonna happen, but just last week, NASA landed a craft onto an asteroid. They just 
blasted an asteroid. So ideally, down the line, if we need to, we can blow an asteroid that's coming towards Earth off its orbit so it misses us. I don't know. That seems a bit more easy than a giant inflatable catching a rock and then letting it go over here. You know what I mean? Let's just blast the thing. I'm on board with NASA. Number four, the second shortest spacewalk. Luca Parmentano, an Italian astronaut with the European Space Agency, faced what's possibly my new worst fear. I can't imagine anything worse than this. Here we go. It was July 16th, 2013. During a spacewalk on the 36th expedition to the ISS, Luca's helmet began to fill with liquid. Not water, but even worse. It started to fill with liquid coolant. Yeah, zero G coolant floating around inside of your mask. That's horrible. Water would be bad. Coolant, you don't want to breathe or drink this in. It's all bad. But being in space, that's a bit unpredictable. You know what I mean? The spacewalk continued for over an hour before Luca was back in the ISS and free from his suit of doom. He was fine, but this accident could have been a lot worse. The second shortest spacewalk in the station's history. Yeah, more than fair. Imagine drowning in like zero G. Ah. Horrible. Number three, Dave Foley. Canadian comedy icon, Dave Foley. Yeah, we're talking about him for a little bit. Let's do it. So when the Kids in the Hall star took to Twitter only a couple of months ago, he caught the attention of all of his followers, including I, Mr. Alien Guy on YouTube. Foley tweeted, quote, after years of interest in the UFOs without ever seeing anything, I saw something. Insane. I also imagine he tweeted this in his Bugs Life voice. That's really, that's just what I do for me personally. This is a drawing of what I saw. I was with a friend who I'll let decide if he wants to be attached to this and moved silently at great speed, hovered and pulsated with light, end quote. Now this ship does look a lot like what we've seen in past reports, so who knows? Maybe Dave actually saw a UFO, sorry, UAP. I have a big alien guy looking at me. He's like, it's UAP. I'm like, UAP, you got it. Sorry, man, that's old school. So who knows? Maybe he actually saw a real life entity. Maybe these aliens are fans of Bugs Life. Maybe they just loved Kids in the Hall. Maybe they wanted an autograph, I don't know. Number two. Tea saucers. So apparently two of the editors from Titanic, yeah, have publicly made a comment saying that this video right here, if it was fake, would be very, very hard to do. They did the Titanic, dude. At first I was like, yeah, this is so fake. It looks like the intergalactic Beastie Boys music video. I was like, what? It looks so fake. It looks like the 1902 trip to the moon movie, like the black and white video. You know, the one with the guy's face in the moon is just like splat like the rocket ship crashes into his face. Like cheesy, right? Cheesy. Like a saucer on a string over a model building type thing, cheesy. Uh, nope. Apparently this one has experts stumped. Taken in 1997 in Las Lomas, Mexico. Always Mexico, dude. They have the craziest sightings. Look, it looks fake, but when people who edit stuff every day in the movies are like, uh, yeah, we, we uh, don't know how to do that yet. That's when it gets really scary. Number one, 2021 flyby. It's odd because we obviously joke and have a good time on this channel, especially when talking about aliens, of course. It's a nice change than, you know, King Henry and, oh, you know, cutting heads off. It's nice, we like to take a break. But for our number one spot on today's list, look at me, look how serious this guy is right now, right? I'm cocking my head to the left, I'm squinting at nothing. That's how you know it's real. I could tell anybody bad news with this face right here, and I'm here to tell you today on Bumblebee that we are not alone. Aliens do exist. They came out with this vertical portrait mode video. That's how you know it's real when it's filmed like a world star video. And the video itself is quite short and that's because it's taken in the cockpit of a plane that is currently flying at high speeds, at very high altitudes. But it appears to be passing a metallic sphere. Yeah, this is what happens when a UAP enters restricted airspace. The pilot attempted to communicate a warning to said object, but of course, it was to no avail. I just said it was to no avail. That's how you know I'm being serious. There you go. These things are whipping through the air well beyond the speed of sound, yet there's no atmospheric disturbance, no sonic boom, no turbulence, only questions. Number 10, Al Warden. American test pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut, Alfred Merrill Warden. The pilot for the Apollo 15 lunar missions in 1971. One of the 24 people that have gone to the moon. Woohoo! He orbited it 74 times. Well, he was the first to even drive a moon car. Warden remained at NASA until 1975. And then it gets a little weird. Recently, on a morning show, they asked Warden, why do we keep going back to the moon? He paused and said, quote, survival. Survival of our species. When pressed on aliens, he said, you know, we are the aliens, right? We just think there's somebody else. We're the ones who came from somewhere else because somebody else had to survive. They got in a little spacecraft and they came here and they landed and they started civilization here. And if you don't believe me, go get books on the ancient Sumerians and see what they have to say about it, end quote. <laughs> yeah, that's not uh, terrifying at all, Al. Number nine, Edgar Mitchell. 
Edgar Dean Mitchell was a US Navy officer, aviator, test pilot, engineer, NASA astronaut, and of course, ufologist. Ufology is the pseudo term for somebody who studies UFOs. I don't think there's like a degree you can just get that in. If so, where? I'm signing up. Just needed a name for it, I guess? I don't know. The lunar module pilot of Apollo 14 in 1971, guy clocked nine hours working on the moon. He was the sixth person to walk on the moon as well. Mitchell publicly expressed his opinions that he was sure that there were thousands of UFOs recorded since the early 1940s, apparently belonging to other planets. Thousands of them. NBC conducted an interview in 1996. He talked about meeting with officials from three different countries who said that they had met ETs in person. Quote, the evidence for alien contact is very strong and classified by governments who are covering up visitations and the existence of alien bodies, specifically in places like Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, sorry, do you mind if I just see his credentials one more time? Thank you so much. Number eight. James McDivitt. James Alton McDivitt is an American test pilot, Air Force pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut who flew both in the Gemini and Apollo programs. McDivitt was selected by NASA for the Gemini 4 mission, and in 1965, he saw, filmed, and photographed an object, which approached the Gemini 4 as they were orbiting Earth over Hawaii. Apparently, the UFO had a long arm sticking out of it. Quote, I was flying with Ed, he was sleeping, we were drifting, when suddenly an object appeared in the window, a cylindrical object, white. The film was then sent back to NASA and reviewed by NASA film technicians in 1975. It looked like a white beer can with a pencil sticking out of it. Yeah, he tried for years to get the word out about the phenomenon, but NASA lost those pictures apparently. Oh, that James, he's a, he's a crazy one up there in space with all those degrees he has. What a wacko. Number seven. Parked alien. Okay, when I first opened this link, I jumped. So just a heads up, you got a creepy alien face coming in in three, two, one, bah, there it is. It's silly, it's scary. I'm not really sure how I feel about this one, but either way, it definitely looks real. Reddit users claim since this photo hasn't been fully debunked, it can still be held up for debate. Fair. They're like, well, it's not, not real. We're like, uh, I guess, sure. A common argument is, where's the prop then, okay? Where's the material that made this exact alien suit? This looks better than today's CGI. Let's just use that from now on in movies. This reminds me of the alien from Signs, that birthday party scene alone. That could have been number one. That was some, that f me up for like eight years straight, for sure. Number six. Iron Man? Uh, yeah, here, just for my sanity, we are all aware that not only do we have orbs, we have saucers, then triangles, and now Iron Man suits. Dude, this thing has a jetpack built into itself. That's gotta be Tony Stark. A silver saucer is scary enough, no? Imagine a little Jetson pod alien dude just hovering up to you on the side of a building. Like little escape pods. What is this, No Man's Sky? Like the dudes who commute to work on those one wheel things in the bike lanes doing like Mach 12 with shoulder pads on? This is exactly where we're headed in like 15 years, aren't we? This thing just whips back and forth too. It makes me laugh so hard. Just the physicality alone, you know what I mean? Like he can't get it. He's just like left, my left, my left. Sorry, right, right, right. Number five, driveway alien. Doorbell cam footage gave homeowner Vivian Gomez quite the shock on June 2nd, 2019. Yeah, she looked and saw maybe an alien. We're not sure yet. What is that? Is that a person? That's a thing? I have no idea. I also love how unsure he is at first, like which direction he's going. If that's an alien, he has no idea where he is. He just had a rough night. He's like left, right, either way. I'm pumped, let's do it. Like he's like, yeah, eastbound, westbound. Where's my planet? Is it, eh, yeah, this one. He's like dapping himself up on the way out. Whatever happened in that house, probably great. He probably got to like third base and he's like, He's ready, man. I don't know, fake or not, I hope aliens move like this. But he's got sea legs. He's not used to our gravity, clearly. He has no idea what he's doing. A little stronger than the moon. Number four, MUFON. Just shot over Houston, Texas. Dude, is this thing a giant floating Christmas tree ornament or a halo ship? Cause like, <laughs> what, what, what am I looking at here, you know? Dude, stuff like this freaks me out. Cause like, as humans, we think we've seen everything and understand. And then you see like a new light up squid and you're like, Oh, that makes my brain feel weird. Like when I don't know what I'm looking at and things are just like weird colors and different shapes, I just panic, you know? I feel like I'm losing grips on reality. Also, this thing is a MUFON case, which stands for a Mutual Unidentified Flying Object Network. It's like 50 countries all working together, sending each other videos like this. It looks like some sort of glittery anomaly. See, I'm quick to say spaceship, but then again, I just saw a nope over the weekend and like, yeah, I don't really know anything anymore. This could be a creature or a body or a projection. It's 2022, I don't, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know. 
Number three, Gordon Cooper. Leroy Gordon Cooper Jr. was an American engineer, test pilot, US Air Force pilot, and the youngest of the seven original astronauts in Project Mercury. You know the pictures, it's the old school tin foil suits. 1963, Cooper piloted the longest and last Mercury space flight, Mercury Atlas 9. 34 hours in space. The first American to spend an entire day in space, the first to sleep in space, and in Cooper's autobiography, Leap of Faith, he recounted his relationship with the Air Force and NASA and their relationship to the UFO conspiracy. Cooper claimed to see his first UFO while flying over Germany. He said that there were hundreds of reports made by pilots, many coming from military on radar. In 1978, he even testified before the United Nations on the topic. Radar operators, fighter pilots, fellow astronauts. He was a strong advocate for disclosure up until his passing. Number two. Lost in space. During the 60s, the space race was on between the Americans and the Russians. Like a good old hockey game, huh? Those two, always at it. The first to figure it out what it is to put something or someone up in a little metal box. It was actually the Soviets that secured many of the early victories. While NASA's efforts were widely publicized, of course, sometimes the Soviets made it a point to never announce a mission until days after it was completed. And of course, successful. This allowed them to maintain control over information. Enter stage right, the Giudica Cordiglia brothers from Italy. Former amateur radio operators who apparently caught Russian audio recordings which allegedly proves the Soviets covered up cosmonauts failed missions in the early 1960s. Apparently she's saying, help, help, I feel hot, am I going to crash? Uh, yo, that is absolutely horrifying. If this is the real deal and the Soviets sent a woman into space that maybe didn't come back, this proves that whatever happens in space stays in space. We're only told what we're supposed to hear. Number one, Buzz Aldrin. American astronaut, engineer, fighter pilot with a doctor of science in astronautics. This guy is overqualified. Three spacewalks in 1966, Gemini 12 mission. As the lunar module Eagle pilot on the 1969 Apollo 11 mission, he and mission commander Neil Armstrong were the first two to land on the moon. There was something out there close enough to be observed and what it could be according to Aldrin on Apollo 11 to the moon, he observed a light out of the window that appeared to be moving alongside them. But what could it have been other than another spacecraft from another country or maybe even another world? It was either the rocket that had separated from us or the four panels that moved away when we extracted the lander. After he returned home from his missions, he was convinced that he saw aliens while he was out there. Credentials aside, Guy took a lie detector test, which he passed with flying colors. In an interview with C-SPAN, Buzz talked about the future potential of the Earth's moon for humanity. He added a little extra info that might have ignited the spark to go back regarding a certain monolith on the moon. Quote, visit the moon Phobos of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato object that goes around the moon once every seven hours. When people find out about that, they're gonna say, who put that there? Yeah, I'll be the first one, Buzz. Who did put that there? Number 10, Soyuz 11. It was April 1971 when the Russians launched the world's first space station. Three cosmonauts aboard said space station. They all spent three weeks observing, conducting experiments, you know, dare I say, normal space station behavior. But their return trip, however, on June 30th, that's when things took a tragic turn. The spacecraft made a normal re-entry and landing, but when the ground team opened the hatch up, all three cosmonauts had suffocated. What happened? Well, it turns out a faulty air vent had opened 30 minutes prior when the descent module set Separated, and the cabin had actually depressurized. From that point on, the Soviet and the US space programs would ensure that their astronauts had to wear spacesuits during any phase of any mission where depressurization could possibly occur, just to be safe. I couldn't imagine how scary that would be. Also, just wear the suit all the time. It looks cool, it looks pretty badass. I'd wear the suit at home, are you kidding me? Make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich wearing that thing. I'd walk all slow too, I'd really do it like I was in space. Number nine, Project 1794. This project was created with the goal to build sort of a saucer type aircraft that would be designed to shoot down Soviet you know, attacks. This program was created in the 1950s and it was quite ambitious. It had some pretty, you know, high goals. Some Tom Cruise-esque goals. If you've seen Top Gun Maverick, here we go. A team of engineers began trying to build a disc-shaped aircraft, but here's the kicker. They wanted it to be capable of traveling at supersonic speeds at high altitudes. They had to go fast. The documents about this project show that they wanted to be able to travel at Mach 4, which is well, four times the speed of 
of sound, and they wanted it to be able to reach an altitude of over 100,000 feet. Yeah, at the time, the project was estimated to cost around $3 million, which is around $26 million today. I acted like I thought of that, but I wrote it down. I couldn't do that math, are you kidding me? In the end, the project was canceled in 1961 because the craft failed to all these tests and proved to be aerodynamically unstable, which of course would provide a whole slew of problems at a high speed, especially supersonic ones. Again, if you've seen Top Gun Maverick, this is a, a waste, a big waste of money. We didn't, we didn't get it with this one. Number eight, too fast. We're at this stage in life now where Teslas are self-driving people to work and I can't do it. I'm a, I'm a 10 and two guy minimum, at least a 10, you know what I mean? You never know what technology might do, what choice it might make for you. Humans are still, you know, better than computers. I don't know, I'm scared. I've, I've watched Black Mirror too many times and it shows. On June 4th, 1996, Europe's Orion 5 rocket launched successfully, but 30 seconds into the flight, the rocket flipped 90 degrees out of nowhere and the onboard computer triggered the self-destruct mechanism just two seconds later. That fast, it just made that call automatically. Instead of a launch where a human would make a call to, you know, maybe self-destruct, this is just the computer making that call. It's not very ideal, that's, that's terrifying. This rocket knew it was going too fast and it just dipped. The investigation revealed that some sort of old code wasn't properly adapted for the new Ariane 5. Old code for the four, into new body equals problems, yeah. In this case, the engineers had decided the specific velocity in question was too high to become a real problem. That was only true for the Ariane 4, so you'll live and you learn. Number seven, Dark Side of the Moon. Not just an absolute banger of an album, also one of the most terrifying, mysterious places in our galaxy, the dark side of our moon. Since the 1950s, NASA has seen and heard some pretty weird stuff back there. See, once you sign that non-disclosure, they kinda own ya, you know? Despite what you may have heard, it's true that the Apollo 10 astronauts did hear some interesting sounds behind the moon, described as outer space type music. Audio recordings from the Apollo 10 mission, astronaut Gene Kernan asks John Young if he hears that. Gene calls it music and says it even sounds outer spacey sounding. Young says, we're gonna have to find out about that because nobody's gonna believe us. Hey man, no one believes anyone who's gone up there, so don't take it personally. Astronauts go through visual and audio testing like the Navy SEALs. They know what they're doing. If they say Angel by Shaggy is playing back there, I'm believing them. Number six, Leland Melvin. American engineer and NASA astronaut on board the space shuttle Atlantis, selected by NASA in 1998. This guy's put in time with mission after mission. Melvin has over 565 hours in space. Quite the practice at the whole floating around thing, I'd say. When Lee Lin then was pressed about otherworldly visitors, he said he had seen something translucent, curved, and organic looking when he was working with fellow astronaut Randy Bresnik. The pair called the ground to ask NASA what it could be, and NASA's response was, eh, probably ice, probably ice. Nice and scientific, Houston, thanks for that. Mr. Melvin dismissed this and figured it was just NASA's explanation to cover it up. Like, who's more qualified here? That's all I'm asking. When the most qualified people are like, yeah, I can't tell if that's frozen water or a spaceship. Either they shouldn't be up there at all, or they need some more Windex on those windows, NASA. Number five, Ivan Wagner. Astronaut Ivan Wagner was on the ISS as a first timer in 2020. You think they like do trades initiations to the rookies up there? Like no gravity and buckle you when you sleep? Ah. What do you think? He and fellow Russian Anatoly Ivishnin are working with Chris Cassidy up there, the American commander of said expedition. Wagner was then orbiting the Earth and might have actually captured footage of UFOs, better known now as UAPs. The aurora lights behind Earth's beautiful curves was being recorded and it was seen he labeled the video Space Guests. Wagner then tweeted the vid, the aurora australis near Antarctica and Australia, and then this blob of organized lights shows up. Of course, NASA didn't follow up. Like, what are they gonna say? Uh, yeah, that, that's a swamp gas, birds, balloon, grass, cars, something up there, I don't know. Cut the feed, cut the feed. Number four, moonwalk. Yeah, so apparently the footage our parents and also 650 million people across the globe watched in 1969 was not the original footage. Hold up, hold up, what? Yeah, apparently what everyone saw on every television set across the globe wasn't as 4K as NASA's end. A man by the name of Gary George came across some very, very old tapes that might be proof as to what NASA sees and what they hear on their end. It's a little different than what we see. Gary George bought 218 surplus government tapes, three reels labeled Apollo 11 EVA. He auctioned them at Sotheby's, first generation of the moonwalk. So hold on. 
NASA just had a clear copy of this the whole time. I get it, maybe they had a bigger budget. I'm thinking so we can't see what's in the background or what's flying in the background or any stars in the background. Yeah, I just wonder how long it's gonna take before Robert Bigelow or Tom DeLonge get their hands on that. Hey mom, there's something in the background, guys. Pay attention. Number three, Phobos 1. It was 1998 and we'll look over to the Soviet Union for this one. Back in 98, they launched the Phobos 1 spacecraft to study Mars' moons and even possibly land a probe on Phobos, the largest moon of them all. On September 2nd, 1998, mission operators lost contact with the spacecraft and they never heard back after. Yeah, just ghosted them and then drifted away in space. How rude, right? So what went wrong? What went awry, if I may? Well, software uploaded on August 29th, well, it turns out somebody missed a single character. Again, a little tiny error caused a the biggest problem. This put the spacecraft into a steering test mode for some reason, which also deactivated the spacecraft's thrusters. So eventually it ran out of battery power and communication. And now it's just floating off into nothing. It just doesn't even do anything. Number two, space workout gone wrong. Again, another new fear, I guess. Look, zero gravity. I can't imagine how hard it is to stay in shape while you're floating on the ISS. It's always funny to watch astronauts return. You know, they're all like sea legs because they haven't been able to do a squat in so long. They haven't needed to actually bend over to do anything. No gravity. But it's vital for that return trip later that they're, you know, in shape. So they work out in zero gravity, but it has its dangers. In 1995, astronaut Norman Thagard was working out, getting his lunar leg day in doing some knee bends, but while doing so, one of the straps snapped off his foot and flew upwards, hitting him right in the eye. Gravity or not, that's gonna suck. That's gonna leave a mark. Thagard had trouble looking at light from that point on, which when you're in space and you're an astronaut is really not ideal. Steroid eye drops healed Thagard's eye ultimately, but yeah, could have been a lot worse. Imagine losing an eye in space. You know who lost an eye in space? Thor. It's pretty bad. And finally, number one, the Challenger disaster. There's a series on Netflix about this entire situation I implore you to watch. It's hard to watch, but way more informative that I can be in, you know, 45 seconds. On January 28th, 1986, barely a minute after the space shuttle lifted off, a malfunction in the spacecraft rubber seals that separates its rocket boosters, it caused a fire. And from that point on, everything happened so fast. The blaze spread up the rocket itself and the disaster sadly led to the deaths of all the astronauts on board, including a teacher, Krista McAuliffe. Now with it being minus three degrees Celsius outside, the engineering predicted some sort of failure, but NASA had already delayed this launch multiple times. So they wanted to press on and launch anyways. The disaster resulted in the temporary suspension of the space shuttle program. So let's hope we learn some things. Again, watch the Netflix series, much more informative than I can be in this video. Number 10, Flat Earth. Oh baby, it's bizarre, all right. Listen, I'm not gonna pretend to be a scientist or anything, cause well, Truth be told, I'm the farthest thing from it. Really, if you looked at it, I'm nowhere close to a scientist. My science education goes about as far as high school and even that's debatable because the teacher who was, well, teaching me chemistry uh, was a newfie. Nicest guy on planet Earth, but I have no idea what the hell he was talking about half the time. Literally, I have no idea. But I learned enough to get by so I can more than confidently tell you that the Earth is in fact not flat. That's right, not flat. There is no ice wall, there is no global conspiracy of all all the world's nations. While we could probably agree that the government or everyone's governments are hiding something, it most certainly isn't the knowledge that the Earth is flat. They're definitely not hiding that. That's, that's not what they're hiding. Lastly, if Earth is flat, then why are the other planets, moons, and other celestial bodies in our solar system round or spherical? We're flat, but everyone else is round and spherical. That, that, just, that just don't make any sense, partner. Number nine, Operation Paperclip. At the end of World War II, Americans were strolling through Germany one day and saw some really cool stuff. V2 rockets to be specific, ooh, ooh, cool. And they said to themselves, ooh, yes please, I would like some of those for myself and the rest of America, thank you. So they rounded up some not so nice gentlemen who were in a lot of hot water and brought them back to America where, well, they helped develop military technology, but more importantly, rocket technology. This was all thought to be a crazy story, but it turns out to be true. Who would have thought all about space? Like Werner von Braun, for example, not so nice German guy, but was keen helping NASA develop rocket technology that got us to the moon. Yeah, he did, that's how it happened. That's life, Operation Paperclip. Number eight, Venus and Earth. Venus and Earth are both very close in size and mass. They also are made up of the same composition, not to mention that we're neighboring planets. It's pretty cool. But if you haven't noticed, one planet is full of life, water, oceans, and has McDonald's. The other is a galactic wasteland with an atmosphere 100 times thicker than Earth and it rains sulfuric acid on a hellish landscape below. Also, no McDonald's. 
I like that's my indicator for like a, a planet. No McDonald's? I'm not going. The running theory is that Venus used to be a sister planet to Earth, or just like Earth, and may have supported life with oceans and all the beautiful stuff we have. However, whether it was the inhabitants of Venus or a natural disaster, she is no more. So the theory is there was something there, now there's not. Hmm, strange. Yeah, that's strange. Number seven, 2001 Genesis. I've personally never been skydiving before, and I don't think I could ever. My friends are talking about it right now, and I'm very quiet in that group chat, you know what I mean? I'm absent. Because I'm so worried about the parachute not working. I mean, that's obvious, but it's a very real problem. And one will sometimes see in NASA projects. So, you know, sometimes it goes to shit, even when it's NASA. NASA's Genesis spacecraft launched in 2001, but it's 2004 when it later faced issues. See, when the solar wind sample carrying probe was descended back into our home base, parachute never deployed. It just crashed down. Remaining samples were all contaminated by the desert air. Other samples were just destroyed on impact Obviously, it was a huge mess. NASA's failure report later on in 2009 revealed that manufacturers had incorrectly installed the probe's accelerometers into an inverted position. So the spacecraft thought it was going up when really it was going down. That's a big yikes, that's a big smash. It took five years to get answers, so I'm sure the parachute industry was low for five years because they're like, uh, what happened over there? Number six, Apollo 1. The first fatal accident in the history of US spaceflight. Here we go. It was January 27th, 1967. The first manned mission of the Apollo space program. During a simulated launch, a simulated one, a fire broke out in the command module of Apollo 204 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, ultimately and sadly taking the lives of astronaut Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger cafe. Design flaws in the hatch door made it impossible to open in time to save the astronauts. It was a tragedy. Apollo 13 faced issues as well in 1970 when an oxygen tank failed. The crew was supposed to head to the moon but had to obviously return once they were faced with these impossible tasks. But they still got home so we'll talk about that later. Number five, Mariner 1. July 22nd, 1962, an Atlas rocket launch was successful. Now at first, NASA's Mariner 1 spacecraft had hoped to be the first to fly by Venus and get ahead of the Soviet Union in the, you know, the big bad space race, right? Everyone wanted to be the first to launch and leave for some reason. After launch, it didn't take long for operations to go south. The rocket was unable to steer itself and it was heading towards a crash rather than, you know, the cosmos. There's two things that could happen here. The rocket either lands into North Atlantic shipping lanes or it lands in into inhabited areas, which is a no-go. It's kind of a lose-lose. There's no choice other than to self-destruct. Now, humans made this call a little bit better than a computer just deciding to blow up, but humans made the 700 120 million dollar decision and it came splashing down minutes later. Turns out this was all caused because one programmer left a hyphen out of an equation. Yeah, a little hyphen. I forget commas here all the time, but you know, no tragedy ensues. Number three, the multiverse. Ever been at the fork of the road and had to make a decision? Well, what if I told you every time you make a choice, you unknowingly create an alternate universe where you made the other choice? Mm. While this is just some mind-bending fun to think about by the campfire with your friends, it is actually a hypothesis that multiple universes exist just like in the Marvel movies. Pretty close, actually. Let's take one universe where there is Avengers, one where Thor isn't a gorgeous actor from Down Under, and maybe, maybe there's a universe where I'm good at math. <gasps> Oh, I'd like to go to that one. That'd be kind of cool. I mean, who really knows? I don't. I wish I was good at math. I'd explain the quantum physics of it, but that's a job for smart me in another universe. You know what? It's probably universe 3.14 because of pi and math. That's smart. That's cute. Number two, Roswell, New Mexico. Roswell, New Mexico, 1947. A UFO crash lands in the desert. Government agencies and the military quickly try to cover up what's happened. The crash debris is taken to Area 51 just to make a good story. And for years, people claimed it was little green men and were being tested on at Area 51. <laughs> what? Yeah, so much so that Roswell, New Mexico has now adopted aliens as their own identity. Pretty cool. And the conspiracy, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, sure. However, many years later, it was declassified that it was actually just a weather balloon and it was nothing to be thought of that much and they're just kind of crazy. Although, that's what the government would want you to think though, isn't it? Oh, sure. Number one, nature finds a way. Okay, this one is cool. So basically, we're all made of the same stuff. No matter which way you look at it, we're all made of star stuff. And if the conditions on another planet were similar to ours, then there's quite the chance or the probability that nature would find a way. What do I mean by that? Well, it means that life would most likely be similar on other planets like ours and not weird tentacle monsters with green skin and weirdos like, well, 
like we think aliens are. So that means if a deer on this planet is a deer, that means a deer on another planet could be very similar to a deer, or at least maybe even the same. Oh man, life always finds a way. That's crazy. That's insane. That's a crazy theory. You could run into other us. Wow. Kicking off our list at number 10, Plasma Shield. You'll need your tinfoil hats for this entire video. I'll just start by saying that. The thumbs up and the tinfoil hats, both equally as important. Billions of miles from the center of our solar system, there is a wall. Big Game of Thrones space wall. Beyond this wall, what's over there? We have no idea, really. It's like the boundaries of an old video game. It's just blurry and it's mysterious. There's some sort of energy that protects us from deep space radiation. There has to be. And when NASA's twin Voyager probes pass through this exact region, only three years ago, astronomers saw that the heliopause is a physical wall of plasma that deflects away the worst radiation in the cosmos. So yeah, a big gooey wall is protecting us from aliens and radiation. That's pretty cool. It's not a hypothetical anymore. The Voyager passed by recently. The shield may actually deflect about 70% of cosmic rays from entering our own solar system. I can't even comprehend the size here. That's just the start too. We're only finding out more things. James Webb, he's here to f shit up. Number nine, dead planets. When a star runs out of fuel, it can become a white dwarf. It's the skeleton of a star, essentially. Any planet that's orbiting that star at that point, it's toast. It's probably gonna get wiped out in the final growth spurt of the star. We expect this exact scenario to happen to us here on Earth. We're going to get swallowed by our expanding sun. Yeah, spoilers. Sorry. Either that or its intense gravity would pull us all into our own hot demise. Both pretty bad, but also pretty pretty quick. Only a couple years ago, astronomers discovered an intact planet still orbiting a white dwarf star for the first time ever. This was impossible up until this point. This odd orbit sits 2,040 light years from us here on Earth, and the white dwarf system has its own Neptune-like planet that is slowly evaporating. It's disappearing every 10 days. That's a full orbit over there, just 10 days. Yeah, happy new years, good game. Also, we're disappearing, that's lovely. It's depressing, but this brings light a new theory, that dead stars can actually host planets, even if it's only for a short amount of time. And then, you know, it evaporates us and swallows us whole and burns us. Well, one of the three, it's all gonna suck. Number eight, solar tsunami. I've seen this one here on Reddit a few times and it's baffling each and every time. Some folk on Reddit actually believe that shadow beings live in the sun and that this is actually footage of an alien leaving our sun. Solar flares look odd, but I don't think that it's a quick pit stop for aliens, you know. I'm not totally convinced either way, I don't know. In February, 2019, researchers described a solar phenomenon called Terminator events, which first of all, jarring name, Terminator, okay? These Terminator events are massive magnetic field collisions at the sun's equator. Now, subsequently, these collisions result in twin tsunamis of plasma tearing across the star's surface. It travels at a thousand feet per second. It's pretty fast. It's kind of like the tsunami scene from Interstellar, only way, way worse, totally way worse. Solar tsunamis could last for weeks at a time and may occur once a decade. So keep your eyes peeled. No, actually don't look at the star. Don't look at any star ever for that matter, especially not ours or you'll go blind. Number seven, white holes. Black holes are those magnificent space holes with a gravitational pull so powerful that even light can't escape its grasp once it passes the point of no return called the event horizon. We're not sure if there is a yang to the yang of a black hole, but there's a theory that white holes exist. Get your mind out of the gutter. Okay, so if a black hole sucks everything in at the event horizon, then perhaps a white hole would push everything away. Hmm, pretty cool to think, right? Well, there isn't much evidence to support this. I would like to personally offer the scientific community my theory because <laughs> it's Chetty. What if the Big Bang was created by a white hole, meaning the earliest of the universe's expansion could have been done by a white hole? Uh, something to think about. You're welcome, science community. Just doing my part. Number six, the Fermi Paradox. In a nutshell, the Fermi Paradox states that the known universe is massive. It gets bigger each day. With all those millions and billions of stars and planets, planets out there, you'd think someone would have come by in their flying saucer and said, hello. Well, that may not be the case because, well, we may be it. Personally, I believe there is life somewhere out there, but somewhere is really far away. It's so far, too far to even think about. It, it really hurts to think about how far away it is. But the Fermi paradox argues that it would have happened by now, and the fact that it hasn't solidifies the scary and cold truth that we might be the only living and thinking creatures in a deep, dark, infinite void 
known as space. Man, that's heavy. Number five, Planet X. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and sometimes Pluto. Depends if Neil deGrasse Tyson's in the room. He's not too cool about that one. He doesn't like that one. That's our little slice of cosmic life in the Milky Way galaxy. However, some scientists believe that there may be another large planet hiding out in the sun's orbit. Planet X, as it's been known to be called. Some think it's so large and mysterious that it has its gravitational effects even here on Earth, which is crazy because it's so far away. However, due to the theory stating its long orbit, we haven't seen it yet, or you know, it's not there to begin with. There's also that possibility as well. Yes, it's fascinating, but we know that there's other planets beyond our solar system, so it could be there. It's really just really amazing to think about. Man, I love space. I love space stuff. Number four, the moon landing. There are some out there who claim the moon landing never happened. It was fake, not real. It was a fugazi, says a guy with a tinfoil hat on his head drinking Mountain Dew in his mother's basement. While the folks who wear tinfoil have a point, there's tons of shady stuff surrounding the moon landing. There is, it's crazy. Especially to the average folks like you and me, it doesn't really add up. Missing recordings, footage being altered, light sources not matching up, and some claiming it was even done in a studio, which, hey, there's lots of magic done in the studio, like me right here, right now, yeah. And one of their biggest claims to fame, or their big point, is that they never went back, which, well, that's just not true because 24 US astronauts have been to the moon, 12 of which of those astronauts got to walk on the surface. The truth of the matter is, once you go up and pick up a few rocks, well, it's just not that special. It's little rocks on a big rock. Plus, with gas prices these days, can you imagine what it costs to fill up a booster rocket with space juice? Who's gonna front that bill? You guys gonna front that? I don't think so, man. That's too much money. Oh, hurts to think about. My wallet. Number two, space animals. We often remember Laika, the space dog, and her 103 minute cosmic journey aboard Sputnik 2. But does anybody remember Abel and Baker? Why are we talking about these two? This was the American version of Laika. This was less than two years later, so it wasn't the first animal, so, you know, maybe that's why we don't talk about it. But it was two years later, May 28th, 1959. The United States launched a female Rhesus monkey named Abel and a female squirrel monkey named Baker. They launched them both into space. Now this mission only lasted 15 minutes and they both safely returned back home, which is great. You're probably all curious what happened right off the bat. The monkeys weren't injured from their trip, or so they say, although they were whipping through space at 10,000 miles an hour. I highly don't believe that. This was 1959. This was when space travel became the real deal. The impossible became possible. And it was all because of these animals right here. Abel sadly passed away after the flight in you know, normal ways, nothing to do with the actual flight itself. Meanwhile, Baker, she got famous. She was getting 150 letters a day. I'm talking fan mail. These ladies are icons, okay? Never mind Laika. Laika's time's over, okay? We get it. It was rough. Rough. We like it. Dog puns. That's why we're here. Hit that thumbs up for dog puns and also animals in space. Number one, Runaway Bride. Back in September 2019, a star was detected at impossible speeds. It was just whipping through the cosmos. It was the fastest renegade star ever recorded so far. Hey, you wanna know how fast you were going? It was fleeing across the Milky Way at 1.2 million miles per hour. I'm trying to imagine that and I can't. Where did this even come from? Well, most of the time, these speeds come right after a supernova explosion, but after tracking the star's velocity and trajectory and going, eh, it came from there. Researchers figured out where it came from. It came from a black hole that's massive. It's hundreds of thousands of times the mass of our own sun, and this star just got completely sucked in and then launched out at unimaginable speeds. That thing, like, is this gonna hit us? How many more are out there? This is so scary. I'm gonna get out of here right now. I'm feeling a little hot with all these lights. I'm a little scared. Now I'm thinking about space, and now I'm anxious. Yeah.